All right. So last year, I don't know if anyone was here from last year's talk, but uh, I dragged an entire group of people through an esoteric talk on this very difficult modern poet, T.S. Eliot, not exactly the sexiest guy on the whole planet. <laughs> and I tried to explain why liter you know, modernism and literature and art were still interesting and still fertile uh, and still told us a lot about the world that we lived in, but I was pretty much near the high art. I was kind of scraping the ceiling of hoity-toity high art. So now I've decided that, you know, after, after asking the audience here to go through, you know, all that elevated stuff that we would, we would take it down a couple notches here to celebrity boxing. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I... <laughs> I want to talk about TV today. Um, this is not a talk that I ever thought f for most of my life until maybe about five years ago that I would ever, ever give. Uh, like a lot of people who are involved in sort of education, higher education and literary culture, I edit a literary quarterly, uh, you know, that has like poems in it that are not just limericks and difficult stuff, stuff that takes, you know, energy. I'm always used to being called an elitist, and uh, I'm, I sort of sometimes live up to that role in terms of my taste. And so for a long time, I've just sort of joined everybody else in despising TV. It's an easy whipping boy in our culture, given the kinds of things that are out there. Uh, and God knows they, there's still plenty of them uh, that maybe lack uh, a lot of redeeming value uh, when it comes to deeper questions of the human condition and the social order. <clears throat> so it's still a very mixed bag. Uh, I think my favorite uh, of all the, I was trying to find some of the like worst shows ever. Um, apparently one of the worst shows ever was called Homeboys from Outer Space. Uh, you may want to look that one up. Um, Midget Nation, uh, I, I'm not too excited to watch, but Are You Hot? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <clears throat> I do ask myself that more often in my middle age here. <laughs> but I think maybe my favorite would be, and I haven't really subjected to myself, is this show called Hurl, uh, which is sort of pretty much exactly what you expect it would be. It's a show about making people shout at their shoes or Worship the porcelain god, as we once said. So, you know, there's plenty of reason to, uh, to be critical of television. But what really is fascinating to me is the way that um, a whole new generation of television programs has arisen in the last 10 or 15 years. Now, the, the kind of things I, I don't want to talk about tonight are kind of masterpiece theater, which has been around for a long time. Masterpiece theater, as you know, are usually British BBC productions, very different culture than ours. They actually have like primetime shows with literary critics discussing novels and they're like, who ever thought that you could do that on primetime in, in a civilized nation? I mean, my God, <laughs> how ridiculous. Uh, but, you know, and that always had its slot. It had its niche and it was kind of understood and they were often adaptations of Jane Austen and so on. And of course, Downton Abbey is now reigning supreme in that world, but I want to talk about shows and programs that um, don't really fit in that niche. And what really uh, began the process, I think in many ways, uh, kind of liberated people and uh, gave them a sense of the possibilities was the HBO series called The Sopranos. And uh, I realized that even now, as old as I am, I have to be careful because there's such a short shelf life uh, uh, in culture these days, that something that seems very recent and hip to me, you could be like, huh? You know, that was like so whatever, like when I was in middle school, <laughs> okay? I, so I recognize that, you know, this may not be like as contemporary to you as girls uh, might be, but this was not too long ago, and it's big, and it was really a door opener. As you know, it was kind of a a weird, dark soap opera about a mafia family in New Jersey. And it was mesmerizing for a lot of reasons, you know, including, of course, mob violence and, and crime. What I thought was so great about that show was the way that 
uh, as drama often does, it takes a kind of extreme or dark uh, look at the world in order to show, show us elements of reality that we actually experience and care about in our normal world. But because we're a little thrown back on our heels by the darkness, by the inverted nature of a story that's talking about bad guys, we're kind of titillated, yes, but we're also potentially thrown open a little bit as viewers to hearing things that we might not otherwise hear. That if we looked at more straightforwardly would be like blah, blah, blah. Because if you look at The Sopranos long enough, you realize that in many ways what The Sopranos is about is about a middle-aged white guy in contemporary society trying to keep his marriage alive, you know, uh, see that his kids don't turn into, you know, really bad people, maybe mafia hitmen, okay, but not bad people, right? And uh, that he pays the bills and that, you know, his wife lives in the way that she should live and negotiates the, uh, you know, changing roles of the sexes and definitions of marriage and definitions of work and vocation. I think ultimately that's what The Sopranos is about. It's about being a middle-aged white guy in contemporary America. <coughs> but that's what drama can do. It sort of inverts, it inverts things that often puts them in dark or grotesque or strange ways in order to open us up to kind of receive what otherwise straightforwardly would not, we would just sort of glaze over and not really understand. What The Sopranos, of course, do, did also and fundamentally is change the sort of nature of the way narrative television did narrative. Most of television since its inception has been kind of 30 or 60 minutes and out. That's been the very definition of it. Of course, television arose as uh, something that occurred in a very limited, you know, I grew up with four channels, three networks plus PBS, and you had to sell advertising. And the nature of the programming was to find a way to get you to care about a situation or a set of characters, so we have the word sitcom. You know, a situation was more important than a narrative. The situation was sort of a funny set of people, you know, like a, a red-haired uh, American woman married to a Cuban musician, right? I love Lucy. Now that's inherently, that's a situation that is ripe for humor. Or, you know, I mean, it happens all the time. I mean, um, the Big Bang Theory, kind of a couple nerds with the gorgeous chick next door. You know, it's, it, the situation generates the interest in the story. And generally speaking, while there may be some connections between episodes, there may be some history that's logged, it's not really that important. You could really have a show at any given time that sort of starts from scratch. And that was really the kind of nature of television. And of course, the one exception to this that, again, is very easily sneered at by people would be uh, the, the kind of television that for many years did have long arcs of narrative was soap opera, which is very easy to, to, to sneer at because of its melodrama and its kind of low rent, you know, um, uh, and cliched kind of situations and attitudes. But I've, I know a novelist, Michael Malone, who worked for many years for As the World Turns, uh, and uh, uh, he's, he's the guy who's been on New York bestseller list, and he cared a lot about narrative, and he cared a lot about the way that people related to those stories. But essentially that was the exception to the rule. Then we get this newer thing where we have a story going over an entire season or multiple seasons. And uh, so you find that there is inherently a temptation or a connection at that point with literature which tells longer arc stories. A novel is a couple hundred pages, three or four hundred pages, it tells a longer story. So now you get all these interesting scenarios with these the shows that have been coming out since then. The West Wing was very good, made it through the networks, but then you get shows like Friday Night Lights and uh, Breaking Bad, um, which actually have these longer arcs. And uh, so the writers tend to think 
about where to get the material and the, 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 the TV writers do. And then novelists started paying attention. So you get Sir Salman Rushdie, okay, like, again, megastar of international literature, uh, giving an interview where he announces that he's moving away from novels and into television and that he equ equ equated what's called the role of the showrunner. That's the guy who's the creator, producer, fundamentally initial writer of a show uh, and uh, a a to a novelist. That this is this kind of presiding genius over a, a show. A showrunner is like a novelist. Then you get somebody like Michael Chabon, who is a, a beloved novelist, uh, Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, et cetera, et cetera. He says, there can't be a novelist in America who watched The Wire and didn't think, oh my God, I want to do something like that. He is now with his wife, get this, co-writing an HBO series about magicians who fight the Nazis. <laughs> but he says, the tapestry is so broad, it's like a 19th century novel. Now the question is, why do we have shows like this? What are they all about? Um, you know, these are the, I kind of skipped over these slides. These were kind of the one and out things. What I would, uh, how I would relate to that is to quote one critic who says, these older shows, the dramatis personae existed in a realm that was picaresque. Picaresque, that's a description of a kind of pre novel narrative form with, which was based on episodes, just brief little episodes, one at a time. The dramatis personae existed in a realm that was picaresque, a pre-novel mode in which a one-dimensional protagonist is hit by one damn thing after another. A viewer would spend years, maybe decades, with the likes of Matt Millen on Gunsmoke or Steve McGarrett on Hawaii Five-0 and not know a whit about the hero's psychic interior or personal history. Again, not only sitcoms, but even sort of sit dramas where again, the situation, cool looking guy in Hawaii catching bad guys. Lots of scenes of surfing. Now, these shows are typically, if you wanna use some technical lit crit terms, and I think this is an English class, yes? So, Shows that have that kind of expected format are typically called genre, genre shows. You might uh, say that a good analogy would be from the realm of books. When you go to the bookstore or if you go on Amazon, you can click or walk the aisles. If you're still buying books in stores, please do. Um, you will find what? Mystery, romance, science fiction, or now the single biggest 20 shelves of paranormal teen romance. Okay, so you have genres. What, is, what makes a genre? What's, a, what, what's characteristic of genre? Well, characteristic of genre, of course, would be things like setting. So in science fiction, the future. The Westerns, the West, usually, you know, in the 19th century, etc. Romances always seem to be set on tropical islands where men never wear shirts and have always just oiled themselves five seconds ago. <laughs> and women always wear bodices that seem to be popping. Um, at any rate, where was I? <laughs> Get distracted by those bodices. Um, or by the old oiled guys. Let's not be you know, homophobic here. Um, what you get are a series of expectations, things that you expect, certain formulas, certain s things, which we find pleasurable. And the reason why we read these books is that we want to be rewarded by these things that we, that we care about. Uh, there has to be a certain romantic relationship in you know, a mystery novel between the detective and you know, whoever. There has to be a certain, you know, uh, set of circumstances. The good guy gets knocked on the head, captured by the bad guys, he escapes, etc. All of those, those things are based on conventions. Now, con and, and this is lovely. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan. I read a lot of sci-fi. Uh, mysteries are cool, too. Don't read romance, but you never know. Um, and, 
But it's not as much work. That's partly why we, we consume them. There's a certain pleasure, a certain ability to turn your brain off. It doesn't demand a lot of you. So the question that I have, the kind of mystery that has occurred, which I never expected, is why would television ever abandon that and seek for something more? One critic has called this new form of television ARC, A-R-C, ARC TV, precisely because of this arc that goes beyond the particular episode. Each of these shows tends to want to ask bigger questions. They tend to have a bigger canvas. They may be about a city as much as they are about the characters. It may be about a school, but the school is part of a community. Maybe a small community, but a small community as a reflection of the larger national community. Michael Agresta in The Atlantic said there are three fundamental elements of, the, of ARC TV. He says the first is that it has to hold up a mirror to society. So the shows have to help, help us, to help tell us what we are like, what life is like, how we live, how it is with us in this postmodern 21st century world. The second thing he says is that it has to convey the characters' internal lives with depth and integrity. So how we live, how we are, has to emerge out of character, which is both shaped by the culture in which we live, and then in turn continues itself to shape that culture. So mirror to society, characters internal lives, and then third, achieving new expressive styles that reflect the consciousness and felt reality of the time. So that the very cinematography, the very form of what you see on the screen itself has to be related to the way that we experience the world. So, for example, one could point to shows where the handheld camera began to be really important. Why, why the handheld camera in this world? Well, because, and this goes to reality TV, it goes to this interesting way in which the media, including the internet, make things so immediate to us. I mean, we were watching streaming, streaming uh, pictures of yesterday's explosions at the Boston Marathon before the dust was settled. It was on our laptops. We didn't have to wait to the 6 o'clock news. We were there. And so that sense of immediacy and also that sense of our subjective take on things, the handheld camera is you. It's you, it's your eye, it's you moving in this, what they call something happening in real time, which is hilarious. I mean, imagine that, what that phrase really means. Something happening in real time. Isn't all time real? Well, real time means immediate happening now, not in reflection, not in retrospect, but now. So these are the three crucial things, I think, that are elements of these, this ARC TV. Now, before, I'm going to get concrete very quickly and try to tell you something uh, very specifically to ground this in, in specifics. But I just want to say I think there are five points that I think I'd like to make first abstractly and then try to prove them by these two shows I'm going to talk about. Why television has turned to literature. First is, I think... And this builds on what I've just said. Literature loving or based or related television prefers drama over spectacle. Uh, the word spectacle is meant to convey to us something that we spectate, that we are stand outside of and which is visually dazzling. Uh, a spectacle, when we think of the word spectacle, we think of, you know, the Olympic opening ceremonies. You know, um, a thousand people twirling batons and streamers in, in unison with parachute, you know, people coming in and the queen on TV and all kinds of crazy stuff happening. It's spectacle. It's very much about visual, the visual effects and the kind of um, razzle-dazzle. But drama is something that comes, 
in, from an inward world. It comes from the heart. It comes from within character. And it's often more subtle. It's, it's, it's something that requires effort on our part to relate to. So spectacle versus drama. There, there has to be, for all of our negativity about the state of our culture, some lingering hunger for drama, some impatience with spectacle, something, some desire for something more. Second, detail. Literature is made up of detail, concreteness. Literature never works as a summary. Literature works by giving you those very immediate details, the color of the sort of sunset light on, you know, a woman's dress. Um, so detail is important. Detail which the one hour and out shows never had time to pay attention to. Third, it, arc, an arc is required. A narrative that traces characters over time in which those characters change and evolve. Now some of the coolest types of arc TV, in my opinion, are the ones that show characters changing sometimes radically, sometimes off, you know, reversing roles. Now of course that can be dangerous you know, when you see a character who's one way become another way and you think sometimes the writers are just trying to have fun with us, but people do change. People's circumstances change. People's ideas and convictions change. And that's one of the powerful things about ARC TV. So, drama, detail, ARC, character. I've mentioned it. It's implicit in everything I said before. Character. This is what fiction, this is what literature, great literature does. It makes us interested in human characters, in the complexity and often the paradoxical nature of who human beings are. And then fifth and finally, ambiguity. Literature thrives on ambiguity because life is ambiguous. However many moral, intellectual, political principles we want to abide by in life, we find that in everyday experience, it can sometimes be difficult to apply them. And so life is, you know, ambiguous. And so great literature reminds us of uh, how difficult it is to navigate our way through experience. So a cop in ARC TV could be corrupt, could be somebody who had an original desire, you know, to help, but who's gotten caught up by a system, despairs and decides to make, you know, make it at least pay off, etc. I will get very concrete with this. Homeland, the show right now that's, that's a lot of people are interested in, is all about ambiguity, about, you know, this whole world of, of international terrorism and loyalty and Americans going off to wars that you only see for five minutes on the news clips, if at all, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's deeply ambiguous. And uh, it, 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 it's the kind of opposite of uh, George W. Bush on the aircraft carrier after the Iraq invasion with that huge banner, mission accomplished, right? Mission accomplished. I mean, that had to be one of the worst PR moments in the history of American culture. As if things were done. That's going back to, that's going back to gun smoke, one hour and out. We drive in with the tanks, we take, we take the square, we're done. Well, no. That's the agonizing, frustrating, dispiriting, baffling, agonizing truth. The tanks roll in, and life is even more complicated than it was before. The crowds don't, it's not like France in World War II, where everyone, you know, yeah, sure, they pull the Saddam statue, and then they kill you with an IED the next day. What? We, we liberated you, right? This messiness, this, this ambiguity. No show does this better than The Wire, which if you haven't seen, I really highly recommend to you. It's one of the great, great, some people think of it as the masterpiece of this whole new generation of programs. Ironically, given this evolution of television and the business of TV, though it was, went for five years, The Wire never won a single Emmy. Desperate Housewives won at least six. And you get this often with the Oscars, too, where you have a very conventional older generation voting these awards 
and kind of missing the boat, missing the cultural boat. The wire is set in the drug trafficking street, the drug trade on the streets of Baltimore, where the city itself is like a character. One of the biggest connections, one of the biggest analogies that's been made about The Wire over the years is the way that it makes people think of Charles Dickens. David Simon, the showrunner, again, a guy who has uh, almost novelistic skills as a writer, uh, has talked about this, even made the Dickensian nature of the show part of the final season's uh, storyline. Simon, by the way, uh, like some of these guys, started in journalism. And the relationship between journalism and fiction uh, is often very close because a lot of great uh, novelists start as journalists. Charles Dickens started as a journalist because, as you can tell, it's about writing about everyday experience, listening to people's stories, listening to them talk about their lives. David Simon was a beat reporter for, the crime reporter for the Baltimore Sun. He wrote a book called Homicide, um, Life on the Streets, that later became a television series that was a very fascinating transitional series on NBC, which always got low ratings, but which he eventually got a, a, a bit part uh, writing on. And it was an amazing series. Again, if you ever want to see, you know, I don't know what, they're, what streaming media they're on or what you, know, what you can get them as discs, I know. Um, but Homicide was this 1990 series written by a guy named Tom Fontana who, it was really a show that while it was about homicides, it was about these characters talking to each other. It was a very talky series. And it opened uh, up the possibility of, of this interest in character, interest in language, um, as well as visuals, and, uh, and an interest in a kind of long story arc. Dickens himself not only was a journalist, but for many of his books, wrote them in installments that were published in serial format, not unlike contemporary weekly episodes of a show. Some people uh, even still t tell the stories of, what is it, the old curiosity shop with the character of Little Nell? Poor dying Little Nell. My wife doesn't like Dickens' sentimentality. She always calls the character Little Smell. Um, but my wife's from Britain and she's got a pretty harsh satirical sense of humor which I love, of course. But there were people waiting on the docks in Philadelphia for the ship to sail in that had the copy of the episode of the magazine in which we figured out whether Little Nell dies or not. You know, it's like counting down the hours till the show goes on the air. And so there is a great deal of uh, connection between the nature of 19th century fiction, the classic novel, and the nature of some of these serial t television shows. Uh, one of the things that I, I, um, I find fascinating about The Wire is that it really has one of the characteristics of Dickensian sweep, which is what? Which is trying to show the entirety of a social order, from the lowest gutter all the way up to the most fabulous dressing room. And that, that happens in this show because you'll have a scene here on the streets, of course this is the famous, iconic, paradoxical, mysterious, cool badass, but maybe amoral and dangerous character of Omar Little, who is at the heart of most of the series. Um, he's the Robin Hood character, right? He's the guy who steals from the drug, the drug kingpin. So you kind of root for him, and also because he's badass. You know, and you root for Robin Hood. Of course, then you, you're, you're left in this ambiguous situation of like, he's a thief and he kills people, but go, Omar, go, right? <laughs> and so you get, you get um, characters like this who um, represent the lowest of the low. And by the way, some modern scholars have had some fun with these analogies. <laughs> And they've written articles about the relationship between these things. Then they created this, this fake author of the 19th century who wasn't as popular as Dickens but wrote better than Dickens. He wrote a book called The Wire back in the day. And you have this 19th century thing with Omar coming, yo. <laughs> so 
So you have the cops, you've got McNulty and Bunk, and you've got characters like the mayor. And so you go back and forth, you get this entire sweep of a, of a culture. Now let me show you my first clip, and it's going to require just a little, little back and forth here, that provides you, I think, some sense of how class, race, political order can be encompassed in a single scene. I'm going to play to you a scene, and I hope some of the quality of may be pretty poor. Some of these videos are better than other, others. Um, I'm not a tech genius. This is a scene where um, a police captain, a guy who's headed an entire division, African-American, uh, is taking three youngsters, including the son of a notorious criminal, out to dinner at the famous steakhouse known as Ruth's Chris, Ruth's Chris Steakhouse, in Baltimore. And you have a thousand things happening at once, which is what great literature does, right? You've got an African-American man who is, who's risen to a position of authority in society, trying in some ways to have a special occasion for these street kids. And he is in this strange position where he's entering this luxury restaurant as a black man, but he's in this also this position where he's, he's also educated, so he's kind of a figure in between the society that's more cultured and more established and middle and upper class and these street kids. So he wants to bring them along, but he also knows their life and their experience. I'm just going to play you a short clip from this, this sequence, and I think you'll see. So, do you see how everything was going on there? So many different things. I mean, just that one moment where the, the hostess says, can I take your coat? And the two guys say, you know, like, take my coat? What does that mean? You're going to steal my coat? I mean, you know, and the thing is, there's comedy here, right? It's, it's funny, but it's not, when you look at a scene like this, you realize the comedy is not at the expense of these kids. The comedy is more complicated than that. What are you laughing at? Your laughter is nervous because why? It's, it's an ambiguous situation. They're, they're not suited to this world, but they don't, this is not the world they come from. This is not the world they know. You have a, an African American trying to elevate them, but aware of the difficulty of just throwing them into this new world that they know nothing about. So you get something that I think would be, you know, for layers of kind of social and class and economic nuance, perfectly at home in Anna Karenina by Tolstoy. Now, let me show you another clip that's kind of similar in its, its question of somebody trying to elevate somebody to another layer. And this is the first season, this is the arc of the first season. The arc of the first season involves the question of the potential redemption of a younger gangster whose nephew to the big Avon Barksdale, a guy named, character named D'Angelo. And D'Angelo is stuck very much again in the middle. He comes from the ghetto, he comes from the gangs, and his family is royalty, you know, truly royalty of the gang world, but he's got a soul. And so here's a scene where he comes upon a couple of his young henchmen, uh, minions, um, who are really just kids, and he sees them playing a game. Um, you know, and of course, the moment that really it hits home is that moment where he talks about the pawns with these two kids. I mean, that's when, that's when, if you're paying attention at all, it hits you. Here's the last scene from The Wire that I want to show you. This is D'Angelo in jail, and uh, as part of the jail's programming for rehabilitation and enrichment, they're doing a book club and they are reading The Great Gatsby. And so this is, they, this jumps straight into it where characters start talking about The Great Gatsby. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's amazing what can be packed into uh, just a short time span in these kinds of shows. The next show I want to talk to you about is called Mad Men and it's all, uh, very well known, and I may not be telling you stuff you don't already know. Um, it's done far better than I could ever have expected a show like this to do, again, based on 
all my expectations growing up. It's a show that I have a particularly kind of strange relationship to because that, that little boy of the, of the main character of Don Draper, that's sort of me. I grew, my father worked in the advertising business in New York City when I was a boy. And the, the building right above Grand Central that you know is the MetLife building, back in the day it was the Pan Am building. And my dad worked in the Pan Am building right above Grand Central Station, so how cool was that? Um, oops. Um, let's see if I can start a little further down here. Well, let me not even bother with that. Yeah. Ah, look at, look at you. So Mad Men's about the advertising business in the 1960s. And uh, therefore, it's about the post-war era. Starts in the 50s, just starts at the very end of the 50s, the beginning of the 60s, a very pivotal time in American history. And by being about advertising, it ties in so many things. Again, it ties in... Um, our desire for everything. Really, in some ways, you could say that the show itself is about desire, about the nature of human desire. Why do we desire so much? And what do our desires get us? Why is it that when we desire something and even get it, it's not enough? It roots itself, of course, in one of the great anti-heroes, I would say, of contemporary television, Don Draper. I mean, Draper's one of these characters like Tony Soprano who, should you like him or should you not like him? Should you root for him or you, should you not root for him? He's a philandering, uh, escapist, selfish man in very many ways. When you learn a little bit about his backstory, which is gradually unfolded in this series, you begin to have a little more sympathy when you find out that he grew up in the Depression and you find out that he had an abusive stepfather. And these aren't spoilers in the traditional sense because they're, they're, they're revealed pretty quickly in the show in these flashbacks. You learn more, and I won't do more by way of spoiling, but you learn what's made this guy what he is. Through a lucky break, he gets into the business and he seizes his opportunity to find the American dream. Now, there are whole, obviously, there are a lot of things going on in a show like this. You have very strong women characters in the characters of Peggy Olsen and uh, Joan. And uh, each of them, in their different ways, is fighting with sexism and a variety of different kinds of prejudices that women had to struggle with. I think one of the least pleasant aspects of Ma Mad Men, in some ways, is the danger that some of these episodes have of showing us the way people behaved back then and kind of making us be appalled by them. Uh, I mean, it's true that, that that is one thing that a historical show can do to us is help us to recognize that we've come a ways from where we were, hopefully in good ways that make us a little appalled. The danger of a show like that is that it, it can sometimes elevate itself and seem to be a little bit morally above and that we're kind of congratulating ourselves. But at the same time, some of the things that are absolutely appalling about this show, I remember very clearly from my youth. I mean, they were very vivid. And in fact, the scene that I want to start with showing you, showing to you is a scene that very much is something that actually, it's been debated on the internet. I've seen the debates on the internet. Whether this kind of thing actually happened, it did happen. I, I remember this well. Now here's an example of, again, of a, of, a, of a scene where detail matters. This is supposedly an idyllic, oops, supposedly an idyllic picnic of the character Don Draper and his wife and two kids. This is what I love about the artistry of a show like this. They could pan in if they wanted to to the trash. They don't. They, let the, they leave the camera absolutely still. They don't rub your nose in it. It's a, little, it's a little shocking when she just shakes it out, especially when Don throws that, that can. I went to parks in New York City where people did that. Middle class people did that. 
I mean, again, it's sort of, it's almost impossible to, to describe how could people, you know, litter in such an, a, an way. But did you notice the details of this scene? I mean, again, there's a whole novel in this scene. Supposedly idyllic, right? They're lying there, everything's happy, except not. What did you, did you notice anything that was a little bit off? They didn't talk about their money. They didn't talk about their money, so there's a kind of little bit of class conventionality there, yeah. There was never, there was no sustained conversation. Everyone was talking at cross purposes to everyone else. They talked about almost wanting it to be idyllic. We should do this more often. We should always do this. But there's this tension. There's this lack of connection that's going on. Uh, the, the children uh, aren't really attended to in any real way. Um, and then just this... You know, the, the sheer sort of thoughtlessness of it, there's something rotten in Denmark. And of course, there's something rotten in this, in this relationship that's going to take place. Two last clips, and then I'll, I'll let you guys go. But I want to take the same subject from a slightly different perspective. And this is where you kind of root for Don. And you root for him because this is a man who has to articulate and make attractive to us things that we, he wants us to want. That's what advertisers do. But a good advertiser has to somehow connect to something deep within us. At its best, advertising is not crass. Advertising is subtle and full of artistry. And so this is the culmination, again, this is not a spoiler. This is the culmination of the first season when the Eastman Kodak Company has come in and they want to sell this new slide projector that has a circular tray in it. A circular tray which they call the wheel. <laughs> I don't think there's going to be another meeting. It's really powerful, isn't it? I mean, it really does prove its point about how advertising can connect to a deeper bond. And then because we're pretty much out of time, I'm going to race to the final clip because I think, again, this takes the same theme that we've already seen. And this is a short clip. And this, this shows just how literary a TV series can be. This is in season four. So we're well into the season. Season six just started. This is a point where we get a new way of a angling into the material because after his first marriage has ended in divorce, and that's what this clip is about, kind of the finality of that. Um, he starts to journal. And journaling is a narrative technique that lets you get inside the thoughts of a character. It's a brilliant way to get into an interior life uh, f with a medium that otherwise would be just whatever it, you can see in here on the exterior of a character. So it's, it's a novelistic technique applied to film. And this is also, you're going to hear this you're going to listen for logic and sense, but you're going to realize after a sentence or two, this is almost poetry. There's something somewhat surreal and mysterious and almost um, absurd about the language, and yet somehow it holds together. So you start by seeing him writing in his journal, and then you see the scene itself. It's very short. Whew. So again, details are so uh, amazing. I mean, he's driving up to pick up his stuff that's left at the side of the road. He sees the man who's married his ex-wife. He's mowing the grass. And you get this fabulous moment where he, that, that, that man comes into the house. You see Betty. And she's kind of lackadaisically doing the, the, the cake. Did you notice the cake was kind of tilted? And not, it wasn't even like proper. And she's not... And he walks by her. They don't actually exchange a glance. Something's wrong here, too. You know, supposedly in this idyllic suburban realm. The writer that, the showrunner of this show, Matthew Wiener, Wiener has said, um, is his inspiration is the fiction writer, 20th century, mid-20th century fiction writer, John Cheever, who wrote a lot of short stories about sort of affluent, middle, upper middle class guys who would work downtown in New York City in the day and go home to these gorgeous places. Cheever himself lived in a suburb called Ossining, which is right there in Westchester County. 
And these stories would be very delicate, nuanced stories about alienation and ennui among people who should be happy because they live in a kind of paradise, but they, um, they don't. And you get in the, in the voiceover, in the journaling here, in some ways, the most beautiful, powerful um, exposition of the theme of the entire show. Um, we're flawed because we want so much more. We're ruined because we get these things and wish for what we had. Whew, again, I, I, you know, this is not something I would have expected from TV. Well, we started late and it's, it's near the end here. So um, there are lots of other things obviously we could talk about. One thing I didn't talk about is the way a lot of these shows have interwoven plot lines. So you have multiple plot lines going at once. Some people were talking about Dostoevsky earlier, right? Well, in a book like Dostoevsky's The Devils or The Brothers Karamazov, you have all these characters and each character has a story. And like a piece of medieval music, you get all these melody lines kind of intersecting with each other and sometimes they, they meet and they part. It's, it's a very dense way of, telling, of, of narrative storytelling. We don't have time for that. We could have talked, I talked about two of the artsier, fartsier shows that are out there, but just to show you that I'm really not a snob, I could have talked to you about you know, two of my recent shows that live on this border between art and genre are Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> new. Don't know old, I'm not sure I want to know old, but new for sure. I mean, call it space opera if you want, and in some ways it is space opera. I told you I love sci-fi, but that's a show that kicks ass. You know, instead of like having transporters and things where you can just say, make Earl Grey hot tea, you know, you have a really gritty, realistic role on what feels like a battleship in World War II. It's all metal and kind of oil and grease, and they have to pick up phones and talk to each other, and they're at war, and there's this enemy, and the enemy, the Cylons, looks like us, but isn't us. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Or take something that's actually running right now, um, Justified, which is based on a short story by Elmore Leonard. Elmore Leonard himself lives on this borderland between literature and genre writing because he writes these sort of stories of kind of down and out criminals and people on scam otters than the make, but he does so with, with, with prose and with dialogue that's been praised by Martin Amis, the famous British writer, wrote a whole essay extolling the virtues of Elmore Leonard, who's really one of the great writers of our time. I could have talked just as easily about those, but I had easier access to the clips for these two shows. <laughs> so not to be snobby, but you know, there's, there's so much that, that could be said. We could talk about girls, which now you could say is very much a postmodern story that you know owes itself to uh, contemporary writers like David Foster Wallace and uh, and Jonathan Safran Foer and so on we could talk about that we don't have time what I'm I'm happy to say that well we could debate those issues and debate whether these shows are truly good for the culture good for the soul I'm glad that at least we don't have to debate the fact that shows with this kind of literary depth exist and so the debate about how, which ones are good, which ones are bad for you, sometimes the medium is the message, sometimes something with depth and meaning that makes you do so. I mean, I feel like I need to take a nap before I go see a Mad Men episode. It's so emotionally draining. You know, I want to actually dress up slightly and sit down and, and see this episode. It's a miracle. I mean, I, I had low expectations for television being a kid who grew up on it in the 1960s, so I'm just happy to be here talking about the subject. Thanks for your patience. Questions before you head off, any or comments? I know we only have a couple more minutes, but I'm totally happy to, I'm happier for comments even than I am for questions, but I can always try to answer a question. I love your pen. Thank you. This? Yes. Does everyone see what this blah, is? Blah, blah. It's blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was appropriate. I for just like nudged him. I was like, look, look. <laughs> That's what I get it's paid awesome. to do professionally. <laughs> <laughs> Ma'am. Yes, obviously, something like Mad Men in particular, you, 
you really get these kind of heart twanging scenes that feel like melodrama would be the right word to describe them. The reason why, I mean, what's the distinction between drama and melodrama? Um, melodrama involves these highly charged emotional scenes. Um, but what I think is it di what's different about melodrama and drama is what's at stake. You know, I teach writing, and you know, if you've ever been in creative writing class, one of the cliches you're going to hear right at the beginning is, you know, I read your story, and it was powerful in many ways, but I didn't know what was at stake. I didn't know the central character, you as narrator of your own nonfiction story or the protagonist, I didn't know what was at stake for that. I didn't know what, you know, what, what the loss could be. Melodrama seems to me to be where you have conflict and emotion without the pain and the sting of consequences. Consequences that feel real. I mean, there may be on paper there, but when you're so invested in character and you're so deeply rooting for these guys, as, for all their flaws, to pull it out. I mean, my parents divorced in the 70s. I look at these, you know, I can't, I feel that there's an urgency, there's almost a cosmic dimension to your sense of wanting these characters to see that melodrama just doesn't need because it just gives you, melodrama is more like spectacle. It's more like an externality. I don't know that I'm saying this very well, but that's how I would start to try to make the difference, explain the difference. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Why do you think the viewers have changed from just taking in a situation comedy to one an arc storyline? It's a good question. I mean, obviously, one of the, I mean, there are many factors. How could this all happen? Cable happened. Niche marketing happened. Different ways of paying for and, 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 and technological delivery of the medium. So, for example, I'm, I may be an old fart, but I'm, I'm totally into the contemporary fad of binge watching. Like, I'll let a series go for two or three years, and I'll like, gorge myself. Like, isn't it, wasn't it like a week from today that the new Arrested Development episodes are going to come out on Netflix? Yes. It's like, I'm going to take a nap, and I, you know, I don't know, maybe not, but I'll be tempted. There's that great Portlandia skit where they binge watch Battlestar Galactica. So, anyway. Um, you know, honestly, I think part of it is the technology, part of it is the niche. Niches can, can congregate in ways they couldn't. I mean, when you had four channels, you, it was a very crude filter. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, I mean, I think I saw today, I was Googling around trying to get ratings, 3.5 million watch Mad Men, right? That's not bad. Um, I think there's an interactive ineradicable human hunger for, for narrative, for storytelling. And uh, I think for a long time, the economics made cowards of people in the entertainment business. You play it safe. And thanks to, the, thanks to cable, thanks to the way we pay for what we get, um, we had people who were willing to take risks. And I think when people were offered you know, what they had despaired of seeing, they, they, they flocked to it. I mean, even something like Arrested Development, you know, which got canceled, which is, which I could easily also talked about. I mean, it's so funny that we would have just gotten lost in laughing at the scenes, wouldn't have had the intellectual points I wanted to make come through, but, you know, it's, it's as subtle in its humor. I mean, the levels of irony, irony uh, about irony about irony, that you know you can go back and watch this an arrested development and get a scene and get you know it's like you can read a book you can read a short story and go back and get more and more people have a hunger for this and uh you know i think there's a lot that's wrong with our culture believe me and a lot that's wrong with tv shows um but i think that uh there is one sign of hope is that there's some things about human nature that just don't seem to change given half a chance to sprout and grow Firefly. Yeah, I kind of got lost from my, uh, I, I added Firefly this morning. Um, Joss Whedon's brilliant, 
Buffy the Vampire Slayer is one of my favorite series. My wife loathed me for several years um, <laughs> for, for, for watching Buffy, which is social commentary, you know, as well as a strong female heroine. Firefly was, oh, it's like one of the worst tragedies of, you know, entertainment history. That is like, of all the shows that have been canceled, like ever, I think Firefly makes me the saddest. Yeah. Because it, it was my favorite show of all time. Yeah. Like, and it plays with sci-fi and with Western and throws in uh, like 1930s screwball comedy. Joss Whedon has a genius for this. He also loves musicals. I mean, again, we, you know, we talk about contemporary entertainment business as being people with short memories. Well, someone like Joss Whedon actually cares about the tradition of the entertainment business. He actually has mastered the classics. I mean, we don't think in those terms when we too easily criticize the entertainment business, but the people who really rise to the top are people who are just as pious toward their tradition as, say, Wynton Marsalis is towards bebop and, you know, and, and uh, syncopation and all the, cl all the, you know, cool and all the traditions of jazz. All great artists do that, and Joss Whedon's the example of somebody who... Plus he has the incredibly strong female characters. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I think one of my favorite scenes in Firefly was when the um, um, the Malcolm gets uh, kidnapped by the crime lord guy and taken up on the space station with a uh, wash. Remember that episode? Mm -hmm. it was so good. Yeah. No, and he's basically like going on like I'm not space station wife, but just to keep Wash from like going like completely giving up. Yeah. So good. Well, if a show like The Wire or like The Wire is about these two opposed worlds that are almost mirror images of each other, the, the world of the drug trade and the world of the kind of law enforcement, and how both of them have their kings who can't really move very much because they're constrained by their circumstances, um, then you could say that Firefly is about how to try to be independent in a world where these power sources tend to attract everything to them. How to, how to truly stay independent and not sell your soul to one side or the other. And, uh, you know, that's kind of what Star Wars was trying to get at with the rebels, but, you know, <laughs> compared to <laughs> Joss Whedon, you know, I mean, Cap, Cap and Mal is what Han Solo should have been. You know, he's all that Han Solo should have been, that yeah, kind of. Han Solo was very one-dimensional. Yeah, and yeah. And Firefly, for sure. It's in the slideshow, but I kind of got distracted from the slideshow. <laughs> When the screen came up, I heard like people go like Firefly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cult following. I'm still like I'm like I'll contribute to to Nathan Fillion's buying the rights to the show. Uh, I'll send 500 bucks. I don't care. You know, there's these internet sites that are all about that. But anyway, well, I think I have to let you go. But thanks for coming and thanks for you guys for sticking it out here all the way to the end. Thank you. Have a great day.